A very good evening to all of you and a very warm welcome to the last grand round, that is grand round number seven being conducted by the UVIT Society of India. And since we have the annual conference coming up next month from 14 to 16th of October at Hyderabad, apparently this is going to be the last grand round for this season. Uh, we do have a esteemed panel today. And uh, to start with, I have uh, Dr. Marion Monk. She is a uveitis and retina specialist from the University Clinic Bern in Switzerland and managing director at the Bern Photographic Reading Center. She is an adjunct lecturer at the Northwestern University, Chicago. And she has a keen interest in macular diseases, posterior uveitis and imaging. Uh, welcome to the grand round today evening. Thank you so much for the kind invitation, looking forward. Yeah. Uh, the second panelist for today evening is Dr. Francisco Picci. He is a clinical associate in the Eye Institute at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. He is also an associate professor at Case Western Reserve University. He specializes in diseases of the retina and uveitis and has a very keen interest in imaging and has contributed immensely to the application of Okta to assess iris vessels in patients with various vascular diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, and vasculitis. His current research interest is in the use of multimodal imaging of retina in order to understand the etiology of various pathologies and creating objective ways to measure ocular inflammation. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Pichi, a very warm welcome to you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Our third panelist for the evening is Dr. Lucia. She's a professor of ophthalmology with mass, eye, and ear. She's a retina uh, and a uveitis specialist. She's also the director of the Morse Laser Center and has a very keen interest in the genetics of diabetic retinopathy. She co-directs the Mass Eye and Ears Uveitis Fellowship Program. And in 2015, she was honored with the Alcon Research Institute Young Investigators Award. So I welcome you also, Dr. Lucia, for the grand round today. Very much. I'm so pleased to be here with you all. And our fourth panelist is Dr. Vishali Gupta, who heads the Retina and Uveitis Services at PGI yes, Chandigarh. You don't have to. I am not introducing you anymore. And I'm just saying that she's also the current president of UVITIS Society of India, and that she needs no further introduction. And uh, let's, let's see the winner for the best case presentation of the last grand round. So hearty congratulations to Dr. Akshi Sharma uh, from LV Prasad I Institute, Vishaka Patnam. And she presented a very interesting case in the last grand round, which was titled as It's Christmas in Retina, SLE Retinal Vasculitis. So hearty congratulations, Dr. Akshi. And moving on to uh, introducing Dr. Padma Malini, who is the head of uveitis and ocular immunology at Narayan Netrale, Bangalore. She also, again, has a very keen interest in multimodal imaging for uveitis. And she is also the scientific convener for the uveitis Society of India. And she would be speaking to us on imaging the biomarkers in uveitis. Welcome, Dr. Padma, and uh, you can share the screen and start your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, for the kind introduction. Very good, e good evening to all of you. At the outset, I'd like to thank UAT Society of India for giving us opportunity to participate in Grand Rounds 7. And I'll start with my talk on imaging biomarkers in uveitis. Imaging of the eye can be done from pole to pole, that is studying the cellular deposits on the corneal endothelium with confocal microscopy to studying the photoreceptors with adaptive optics. 
Finding out the exact etiology in uveitis is a real challenge. Etiology could be secondary to infective, autoimmune, traumatic, idiopathic, or masquerade uveitis. Even after extensive laboratory investigations, we may not find the exact etiology in most of our cases. Imaging can help us not only in the diagnosis, but also in monitoring the response to treatment. In this talk, I would like to give 10 pearls where the imaging helped us in the diagnosis or the management of the case or what we have contributed to the literature or what are the things in the pipeline to contribute. Coming to pearl number one, here a 51 year old male presented with recurrent redness and photophobia he was treated for anterior uveitis in both eyes. He gave history of COVID-19 infection and he was treated with monoclonal antibodies. Fundus examination was absolutely fine. Suspected viral etiology in view of central white keratic precipitates, ACTAP came negative for viral genome. Confocal microscopy showed how I pattern on the corneal endothelium in the left eye. Specular microscopy showed polymacathism and pleomorphism. In view of these endothelial changes and owl eye pattern, we went ahead and treated this patient for CMV anterior uveitis, following which there was complete resolution of the inflammation and reversal of endothelial changes in both eyes. Here, the owl eye pattern has helped us in the, the, the management of CMV anterior uveitis. We'll move on to pearl number two. Here, 27 year male presented with blurring of the vision. He had significant vitritis with retinitis. Fundus picture looks like headlight in the fog appearance. OCT shows hyperreflective oval deposits at the vitro-retinal interface the post with posterior vitreous cells, increased hyperreflectivity of the inner and middle retinal layers with distortion of the retinal layers, and there was a coronal bulge. Based on this, it goes well with the possibility of toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis. While in treatment with antitoxone systemic steroid, we could see the hyperreflective deposits still present in the posterior eyeloid with incomplete PVD, distortion of the middle and retinal layers with dissolution of the coronal bulge. Yet another case of a toxoplasmic retinitis where we have used adaptive optics to see the changes. Here you could see the hypo as well as hyperreflective dots with the surrounding retinal edema. The picture is similar to what we see it on tachocytes on histopathological examination. This patient was put on antitoxic treatment and systemic steroids, following which we could see the area of IPO surrounded by area of hyperreflectivity similar to the bradyzoid cyst. So we could monitor not only the diagnosis and also the treatment using adaptive optics. Coming to pearl number three, here is a case of a hepatic zoster ophthalmicus with recurrent keratouveitis. We are all very well aware of the anterior segment manifestation. Hepatic zoster also can cause hypopigmented lesions in the choroid, what we call reported as a choroidal vitiligo. This gentleman is having recurrent inflammation for the past eight months. ICG shows hypofluorescent lesions corresponding to the areas of the choroidal granuloma. We did the OCT at the time of presentation. In addition to the hyporeflective coronal granuloma, we also had cystoid macular edema. Started the patient on difluoroprednate along with oral valacivir, following which we could see the resolution of the granuloma. Once it is healed, the thinning of the choroid was noted. Coming to pearl number four, post fever retinitis can be caused by dengue, chikungunya, West Nile and Rickard cell infection. We started noticing ring retinitis in cases of post fever retinitis. Whenever we see a pattern of ring retinitis, we can suspect post fever retinitis. Multicolor imaging help us with the different wavelength can be useful in determination of the activity of post fever retinitis. White color mostly seen on blue and green reflectance when there is an active retinitis dull gray to grayish during resolving stages and dull green in a case of a resolved retinitis. We also have done act of the retinal vasculature in patients with post retinitis, both qualitative and quantitative. 
we did notice DCP has more capillary rarefaction when compared to the superficial capillary plexus. Foveal avascular zone pattern was altered and acta is not useful in acute or gross macular edema. Altered FAS can indicative of macular ischemia where we can assess the prognosis in these cases. Coming to pearl number five, here again, a patient with post fever presenting with a decrease in vision. On this examination, we could see the hyperemia of the disc, area of retinitis with impending vascular occlusion. OCT shows altered foveal contour with hyperreflectivity in the outer plexiform, endless layer, and outer nuclear layer, which ultimately lead to localized disruption of these layers. This pattern is classically seen in foveolitis. Based on this pattern, we did suspect dengue infection in this case. When we investigated, FFA showed early hypofluorescence with late hypofluorescence with the disc leak, and the dengue titer was positive. Following treatment with systemic steroids, there was a resolution of dengue foveolitis. This foveolitis could be a biomarker to suspect dengue foveolitis. We'll move on to pearl number six. Here is a case of a post-COVID retinopathy was treated with systemic steroids. During the resolution stage, we started noticing yellowish infiltrate in the mid-periphery, which gradually started increasing in size. When we did the OCT, we saw rain cloud sign, which made us to suspect the possibility of the fungal etiology. We went ahead and treating this patient with intravitreal and systemic antifungal therapy following which there was complete resolution of the infiltrate and the sign on OCT. Here again, OCT gives us a clue to suspect fungal etiology in this case. The next comes is a pearl number seven. 76 year male, he gave history of recent travel to South America. That was the clue in this case. He also had skin lesions. He had lung infection for which he was hospitalized and he did not respond to antibiotic or antiviral therapy. On systemic evaluation, we could see the erythematous plaque-like lesion with the central eschar. In addition to anterior segment inflammatory signs, he had pigmented keratic precipitates. Fundus examination, both active retinitis as well as pigmentary changes in the fundus with cotton wool spot. When we did the confocal, we saw cyst-like structure, which is similar to histoplasma capsulatum HPE findings on histopathological examination. So we did this in biopsy, which showed fungal spores, which confirmed the diagnosis of ocular histoplasmosis. We treated the patient with intravitreal and systemic antifungal therapy, following which we could see the resolution of the cyst on confocal microscopy. Coming to pearl number eight, here, 58 year male presented with floaters in both eyes. On examination, we could see vitreous hemorrhage, multiple retinal hemorrhages, retinal vascular sheathing, infiltrates, and there are dark spots in the left eye. Then we did the OCT. We saw abnormal OCT reflectivity as what is described in myeloid leukemia this particular patient had. When we did the FFA, we could see the disc leak, multiple pinpoint hyperfluorescence, not only the NVD, but also multiple NVE with significant areas of capillary non-perfusion with hyperfluorescent dots along the vessels. This is a magnified view showing hyperfluorescent spots with extensive areas of CNP. We describe this as a sting of beads appearance on FFA in the case of a leukemia. So the sting of beads appearance of vessels on FFA can be a diagnostic finding in a case of a CML. Here, yet another case also shows vascular tautivocity with miliary aneurysm. This again could be the biomarker for leukemic retinopathy. We'll move on to pearl number nine. Here is a case of bilateral posterior uveitis where we could see the ill-defined yellowish lesions and poor response to systemic steroids. Patient was referred to us. On autofluorescence, we could see a block fluorescence corresponds to vitreous ACE. And there is mottled hypo with hyperfluorescence in the left eye. When we did the OCT, we could see the sub RPE deposits. The first biopsy was negative. Subsequent ones, there was progressive increasing the lesions and repeat vitreous biopsy confirmed it's a case of a lymphoma, primary B cell lymphoma. And 
Or in the repeat time, we could see the white cellular deposits and the corneal endothelium. When we did the confocal microscopy, we saw floral pattern of keratic precipitates. Following intravitreal and systemic chemotherapy, this resolution of the pattern, we reported this as a complete and incomplete floral pattern on confocal microscopy in cases of vitreoretinal lymphoma. We'll come to the pearl number 10. Here is a case of a Bechet's disease in a young boy was treated with systemic steroids and immunosuppressive therapy. He gives history of trauma. The primary repair was done, treated with antimicrobial therapy and systemic steroids afterwards. The patient presented with recurrent um, inflammation. This time the picture has turned into a granulomatous kind of a picture. So he was, uh, when we saw, we could see the curvilinear pattern of keratic precipitates in this child, which was not present earlier. So we call this as a curvilinear pattern of keratic precipitate. On B scan, in addition to vitreous opacities, we can also can see curvilinear vitreous membrane. When we did the AC tap, crack of floor white showing curvilinear high phase suggestive of a curvilinear species. The gram stain and pap smear also showed fungal colonies. The culture confirmed it is a curvilinear species was isolated in the culture. Patient was treated with intravitreal and systemic antifungal therapy. He had a refractory course, really we have to fight. And following the treatment, we could see the disappearance of the keratic precipitates and vitreous membrane. So we would like to call this as a curve sign of curvilinear, where we see a curve shaped keratic precipitates and vitreous opacities. This could be a clue to suspect this fungal infection. To conclude, various imaging modalities can help not only in making the correct diagnosis, but in documenting and following patients after therapy in inflammatory conditions of the eye. I would like to acknowledge my team members, both from the uveitis and retinal services, and also the microbiology and pathology department and management for supporting us with our work. I take this opportunity to invite you all for UCCon 2022, it's going to be next month, 14th to 16th October in Hyderabad. We look forward to seeing you in Hyderabad. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Padma. I think those were excellent 10 important clinical pearls and highlighting the relevance of multimodal imaging in various disease entities. So I would just request uh, some quick comments from all the panelists. We will start with Dr. Marion. Anything to add? No, I think it, um, it was an amazing um, compilation of different imaging modalities. And what I really enjoyed is that, you know, not only like the usual um, image modalities like OCTA um, or, or wide field imaging were used, but rather new image modalities were kind of introduced in order um, to give us more clues in terms of diagnosing or making the right diagnose in these um, challenging cases. Uh, Dr. Pichi, any comment from you? I actually have a question for Dr. Padma. So I see you use a uh, confocal uh, microscopy a lot. So I, I don't have it and I don't have a great experience, but uh, what's your recommendation for uh, uh, the residents and fellow listening? Uh, if available, should we get it for our uveitis cases? Because your, uh, your pictures were very nice and I think helpful in the diagnosis. Yes, confocal, if it's available, definitely I will recommend to use because it gives us a clue. Uh, in 2007, we have published a first paper on confocal microscopy to differentiate between infectious and non-infectious uveitis. Um, especially when we order laboratory investigations, it gives us a few days to get all the reports. Before we take into different directions which line we wanted to go to before starting on high dose of systemic steroids, this gives us an indirect clue to suspect which line to go. Um, we find it useful especially in infective uveitis, it has infiltrative or dentitic in case of viral uveitis. And whenever we see a central globular with dentitic pattern, it is invariably associated with infection. It could be either TB or syphilis or toxoplasma. And um, we uh, off late, we started finding it more useful in a case of masquerades. Whenever we have, we put it across, we found it in case of a leukemia, where we have a large cells with leukemic infiltrate, which we have published in Canadian Journal of Leukemic Infiltrate on Confocal Microscopy. And lymphoma, we found it is a floral pattern. And um, melanoma, we had seen a ring um, 
rod shape kind of an infiltrate so this is two instruments which i find it most useful mm -hmm. in imaging in uveitis as far as the anterior segment is concerned i'll opt for confocal posterior segment is uh, concerned i will opt for uh, multimodal imaging i don't have any financial in, uh, um, interest but i'll opt for spectralis these two will give us a clue especially to dissect it at the anatomical level to plan uh, to put a differential diagnosis and take it forward to order limited laboratory investigation Nice. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lucia, any comment from you? It was an amazing tour de force. I was writing notes as you, was pre you were presenting because there are patients that I'm thinking about now that I'm realizing findings that I hadn't realized before. So thank you for that. My only question is for the first patient with CMV with the owl eye pattern, they, their AC tap was negative. How often is it that you get negative PCR and yet you find imaging findings that make the diagnosis for you? A very rare occurrence. Most of the times, like how example, the CMV anterior uveitis and also like a lymphoma, we suspect, but we don't get positive at first go. I have patients with CMV anterior uveitis where the, after one and a half years, the repeat tape, uh, tap showed positivity. So in this, our line is very, very rare. In this case, I say we got it lucky. We gave us a clue to proceed. Otherwise, if there is no PCR confirmation, we don't start the patient on treatment. Image and biomarker in this case is helped. That is the reason since the talk was on that, I put it across. Otherwise, most of the times we get the PCR positivity and then we go ahead and start the treatment. How will I, we don't see it in all the cases. It is a rare occurrence. We are fortunate enough to get it in this case. Atma, I have a question for you. Yes. Like you show beautiful confocal. We also have confocal, but that is with our cornea collate. And whenever we send across a patient, one, they say it takes a long time to look at it and they generally do not help us that much. And most of the time they are not able to detect the way you do. So is there any trick involved when you are getting a confocal done? Clinically, we'll do the thorough screening and we put the area of interest. If the KPs are present in the central part of the cornea, it's easy to get it. Suppose if the lesion is presenting in the peripheral cornea, as you mentioned, it is time consuming and we need to focus in the area of interest and medical screening will help us to test the findings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. It's, it's time consuming. And once if it doesn't go, we'll go sit and the area of interest, we'll ask them to see till we get the findings. We screen it and we get it in most of the cases. And uh, most of our patients are inflamed. So they find it difficult even for doing it. So in the acute case, if you're not able to do, maybe in the subsequent visit, you can do it and still you find the findings on confocal. If it's acutely inflamed eye, they may not allow us to put the speculum and to do it. So we wait for the inflammation symptoms, acute symptoms to come down. In a day or two later, if you do it, and they'll be cooperative. But many times we try to get the first go because the findings will change. Thank you. Uh, Padma, there is one question posted in the uh, Q&A that for what is the duration of treatment for CMV uveitis? There is no clear-cut guidelines as far as the literature is concerned. We give the induction therapy for about three weeks and then I switch over to maintenance. But here again, there are two ways. If the patient has only anterior uveitis, if it's a, we can try with topical gancyclovir, but it works in only less than 50% of the cases. I will reassess after two weeks. If it's not come down, then I'll go for a oral valgancyclovir therapy two to three weeks, we put the induction and then followed by maintenance. There is no clear cut guidelines how long to give. We go by the symptoms and the signs and the ideal way to do AC tap to prove it negative, but it may not be possible in the follow up. Every time we may not be able to do it. I use confocal microscopy as an indirect tool to titrate my treatment. If still, if it's showing the patterns, then I don't stop the treatment. Once it disappears, then I take a chance and stop. Sometimes many weeks. I think we tried to answer this question in Titan, which is now submitted to the for publication. 
other than Sunfek Chi from Singapore, uh, 72 experts, nobody was actually doing repeat PCR to test whether, uh, you know, to stop treatment or not. And the second one was the duration was very variable, three months to 12 months. Those in the Asia Pacific region had a tendency to treat it on a very long term basis. But those in US and other countries who do not see as much would not go beyond uh, 12 weeks, but still we do not have the final answer. You know, we, we could just yes. talk about the variation. Yeah, for some patients, even we have to give it for many months, even up to a year, because it won't disappear. The minute we stop, they come back with the recurrence. So in that situation, we put them on maintenance therapy. Uh, Padma, there's another question that do you do a contact specular or a non-contact specular microscopy? Non-contact one. And uh, there's another uh, a question that was the IOP high in your CMV case? This particular patient was on treatment. His IOP was not high, but he was very symptomatic. Uh, there's another question that herpes cause the choroidal lesions, vitiligo. I thought viruses affect the retina mainly. Please elaborate. Viral can cause retinitis, but what we have seen in cases of varicella loss zoster virus infection, we have seen hypopigmented lesions in some of the cases which are published in OAI. And if the Many times, if you have an hyperreflective, you do a OCT, you don't get the granuloma. If it's an hyperreflective, it is a heel scar and thinned out choroid that we don't treat. But if there is an active granuloma kind of a lesion present in the choroid, then we treat. It's not only affects the retina, it can also can affect the choroid. The granulomas can present in the choroid, which we have published recently in Ocular Immunology and Inflammation. I ex uh, request them to read. We have published a series. Uh if I can just ask you one question, Padma, since you are using so much of... Yes. Francesco, I don't know you were a part of that. Uh, it was Invernese, like Anirudh, Invernese, and they very categorically showed, and I think that is the question Shahana is asking, that if choroid is involved, this retinitis is more likely to be toxo, and if choroid is not involved, this is more likely to be viral because the viral, uh, you know, does not affect choroid. And now what Padma is saying is kind of opposite. So what is your take on it? So uh, honestly, I, I, I kind of agree with the Ale and Ani uh, that's in Toxo. Uh, the choroid is most of the time affected. So they showed it with OCT and uh, EDI, and there's, al there's always a hyperreflective area of choroidal involvement with loss of the architecture under the focus. And uh, with Ale, recently, we also used OCTA on the focus of, uh, uh, of Toxo to show that uh, if you slice the OCTA at the level of the choriocapillaris and choroid, you actually see satellite foci around the main uh, uh, focus of infection. So to me, the involvement of the choroid in, uh, in Toxo is paramount for the diagnosis. And viral? <sighs> viral, usually no, uh, but you know, viral can, it's a bit of unpredictable, but usually I, I recently saw a case of uh, acute retinal necrosis where the choroid was actually slightly involved. And uh, I looked at the literature and there's only, I think a couple of case reports about it. Um, uh, so it's very, very rare. And I was surprised when I saw this case. So usually no, but we cannot really exclude it. I, I may also add, um, I've, I, I have never seen a case with retinitis where, where really the, the choroid was severely involved. However, I've seen a couple of cases with, you know, very young, um, very, you know, um, people and um, young, young men and women who had like toxo and really only showed the inner retinal um, involvement and no, no curdle involvement at all, which kind of uh, led me to the wrong direction initially. But uh, I think everything is possible. Yeah, I, I also agree with Francesco. It's rare, but it definitely happens. I've had patients present with bilateral acute 
involvement of the posterior segment where there was no visible retinitis, but the ICG showed multiple hypo uh, lesions and it was it responded to therapy PCR positive. So it is possible in rare cases to not have retinal involvement and only have choroidal involvement. And I have also seen the choroidal vitiligo with anterior segment HSV, um, severe HSV uveitis. So I think we underestimate that and sometimes rarely these things can manifest in the choroid. Dr. Ankush? Yeah, so uh, before uh, 2015, I used to think that the viruses causes only retinitis, not choroiditis. But 2015, I saw one case, that was the first case where the patient gave history of herpes zoster and the patient had these multifocal choroidal lesions. And after that, uh, I, I, I have seen uh, multiple cases, almost now I have more than 10 cases in which all the patient had a history of herpes zoster and they had uh, keratouveitis or sclerokeratouveitis and all of those patients had these multifocal choroidal lesions. Then uh, I, uh, when I look into the uh, literature, the first case of this coronal involvement because of herpes zoster were reported back in 80s. And after that, a couple of cases are there, but not a big series. So, uh, but now we have uh, already published a series of five patients and now we have uh, more patients like this. So herpes zoster does uh, involve coroid. And uh, well, we use the term coronal vitiligo, but those are not only vitiligo, uh, we can see coronal scarring on those lesions. When we did the OCT scan over those lesions, it uh, did show uh, coronal thickening or thinning when it resolved. Uh, I'll just take up a few more questions which are posted that what is the preferred oral treatment of choice in toxoplasmosis? Would anybody like to comment on I that? I think Padma can type it. We can move on. It's very yeah. straightforward. Yeah, Padma, you can type the answer, please. Sure, ma'am. Uh, so, moving on, now we'll go on to the case presentations. Thank you, Padma. And I would invite the uh, moderators for the case presentations. So, we have uh, Dr. Ankush, and uh, we also have Dr. Namita Dave, we have Dr. Srinivas Sanjay, and Dr. Sai Bhakti Mishra. So, please take over for the case presentation session. So let us begin with the very interesting cases. Uh, the first case titled uh, Giraffe Skin and Hump in the Eye, uh, managed by Dr. Padma Malini uh, with a team of oncologists and pathologists, and will be presented by our fellow, uh, Dr. Atul. Uh, Dr. Atul, can we kindly share your uh, slides? Yes, sir. Uh Put it on so, a uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. At the outset of the my of my presentation, I would like to thank UCI Society for providing me uh, this great opportunity to present in this uh, grand rounds. Uh, my topic is uh, giraffe skin and hump in the eye, uh, which is moderated by uh, Dr. Ankush Kavali, a Narayan Nitrale UI consultant. So uh, I would, uh, this is a case of 75 years old Asian male uh, who came with the chief complaints of blurring of vision in both eyes since uh, two to three weeks uh, presented in December. Uh, he also had uh, watering and redness uh, along with this. Uh, he's a known case of uh, metastatic lung carcinoma which was detected in August, uh, 2021. Uh, after follow, uh, following detection of uh, metastatic lung carcinoma on lung biopsy, patient had undergone uh, one cycle of chemotherapy with injection pemetrexate 900 milligrams and injection carboplatin 450 milligrams uh, and in uh, September. And uh, following that, patient had genetic mutation analysis done, uh, which showed uh, PD-1 testing score of 80% and EGFR mutation uh, was negative. Uh, for which he underwent uh, four cycles of uh, immunotherapy with injection uh, pembrolizumab uh, within a period of two uh, months and uh, following which 10 days after patient developed blurring of vision after fourth cycle. 
so on clinical examination patient had a, a vision of disc corrected vision of 69 in both eyes with uh, intraocular pressure of 19 in right and 20 in uh, left and was uh, pseudo faking in both eyes on nt segment showed uh, dilated episcleral vessels uh, in both the eyes and uh, multiple stellate uh, fine KP, uh, keratic prostrates with uh, diffuse pigmented cells uh, in aqueous also, there was a patchy iris atrophy in both the eyes. Uh, fund, uh, dilated fundus examination showed uh, multiple gray-brown lesions at the level of RPE, uh, along with multiple uh, pigmentary clumps, which were seen more in, uh, in the nasal quadrant of the eye. Also, there were mu multiple neurosensory detachment, which was more uh, prominently seen in pseudocolor uh, image of MCI. This was, the similar findings were seen in the left eye. On confocal microscopy, there were uh, multiple pigment clumps in the uh, corneal endothelium and uh, incomplete floral pattern was seen in the left eye. On uh, fundus autofluorescence, patient had uh, large areas of hyper autofluorescence uh, with multiple hypo autofluorescence spots at macula and mid periphery uh, and a patch of hypo uh, autofluorescence in uh, temporal to the quadrant temple to the macula. On OCT, uh, this was seen as uh, localized serious elevations temporal to the macula with few choroidal folds and uh, they were more pronounced uh, diffuse RP abnormalities with, uh, with scattered hyperreflective spots. The fundus uh, angiography of both the eyes showed multiple mottled hypo with hyperautofluorescence uh, spots which were seen uh, in early to late phases with a late staining of the lesions. Uh, so uh, this, these findings, the patient had, had we had a different, di different diagnosis of masquerades and uh, pembrolizumab induced panuitis and uh, bilateral diffuse uveal melanocytic proliferation or BDM. Uh, patient was uh, under, patient undergone PET scan, uh, which showed no new hotspots ruling out the metastasis. Therefore, patient was started on uh, topical and systemic steroids, following which there was initial marginal improvement, which was seen after one week. Uh, following uh, at the follow up of fourth week, uh, the patient had worsen, again worsened uh, with, uh, with uh, clear vision of 6, 636 in both the eyes. and increase in uh, uh, interocular pressures with right 28 and left 18. There were increased uh, exudative retinal detachments and along with increased uh, areas of uh, pigmentary lesions, which were seen in the dilated fundus examination. Similar findings were seen in the yeah. left eye also. Uh, fundus uh, autofluorescence showed multiple areas of mottled hypo with high, uh, scattered hyper autofluorescence giving uh, appearance of typical giraffe skin pattern. On uh, OCT uh, at a fourth week showed increase in uh, serious elevations. And therefore, the uh, injection pembrolizumab was deferred along with uh, systemic steroids, chemo, uh, systemic chemotherapy with pemetrexate and carboplatin restarted. And uh, the topical syst and systemic steroids with uh, anti glaucoma medications were uh, continued and uh, ACTAP cytology was done. ACTAP cytology analysis showed uh, pigment uh, melanocytic cells with no uh, mitosis or mitotic figures, and there were no uh, malignant cells. So therefore, orange, uh, multiple orange red uh, geographical patches in uh, giraffe skin pattern, along with pigment clumps over the corneal endothelium with multiple areas of hyper, uh, hyper autofluorescence and uh, exudative uh, RDs with melanocytic cells in uh, cytology which uh, are the cardinal signs pointing towards the diagnosis of BDM or bilateral diffuse melanocytic proliferation. So patient uh, was, as patient was uh, steroid responder, we, uh, we couldn't give the uh, interventional steroids. So we started the patient on uh, anti-VEGF injection or ran ranizumab, uh, 0.5 milligrams per uh, 0.05 ml, uh, each dose of uh, which given was given in each eye. Uh, patient was also continued on topical and systemic steroids along with the anti glaucoma medications and uh, continued. Uh, we continued the topical, uh, we continued the chemotherapy in, uh, with pemetrexate and injection uh, carboplatin. OCT uh, revealed marginal reduction 
in subretinal fluid in left eye, but with no uh, improvement in the right eye at 11th week. Therefore, uh, uh, after taking ethical committee approval and special consent from the patient, we started uh, interferon alpha topical therapy, uh, which was uh, one drop uh, at six, for six times a day. Following at the follow up of uh, 15th week, the patient showed improvement in vision with uh, best corrected uh, vision visual acuity of 612 in right and uh, 615 partial in left with uh, normal uh, intraocular pressures uh, 14 and 16 uh, respectively. On anti segment examination, there were decreased episcleral congestion along with a uh, few uh, resolution of the uh, state KPs and pigment cells in aqueous and uh, patchy iris atrophy. Fundus showed uh, persistent patches of gray brown lesions uh, in giraffe skin pattern uh, in both the eyes. And um, confocal microscopy showed a decrease in uh, pigment cells in uh, endothelium. The OCT showed uh, complete resolution of uh, subretinal fluids and serious elevations at the end of the uh, interferon alpha therapy. Uh, we also did uh, tear cytokine bi biomarker analysis, uh, which showed reduction in uh, inflammatory biomarkers except uh, VEGF8, which was elevated uh, in the last visit. To summarize, uh, when the uh, initial presentation, patient had uh, serious elevations, multiple serious elevations in both the eyes. On first week, there was some uh, uh, subretinal fluid reduction, which was seen with stero systemic steroids. But uh, it wasn't in, uh, in th subsequent third week uh, with uh, exudative retrenchments. And therefore, the pembrolizumab was stopped and AC tap cytology was done. Chemotherapy, pemetrexate, and uh, carboplatin was restarted. At uh, eighth week follow up, uh, there was no improvement in uh, 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 this exudative retrenchments. So, anti VEGF uh, was started. Following eighth week, uh, following eleventh week, the patient showed marginal reduction in the RDs. Uh, therefore, the patient was started on interferon uh, alpha therapy. Uh, at fifteenth uh, week, there was complete resolution uh, of uh, after completion of the uh, interferon alpha therapy. After which, the uh, uh, interferon alpha was stopped, and patient is right now on only uh, chemotherapy. So. Uh, at the end, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Padma Malini, uh, head of UVL department, Narayan Nitrale, and uh, Dr. Prasad Narayan uh, for managing this case. And all, I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Shruti Arsha, uh, Purna Chandra sir, and uh, Raksha Rao for uh, helping in uh, achieving this diagnosis. So my questions to the panelists, uh, sir, can. Hello. Yeah, did you finish with the presentation? Yeah, please go ahead You're with right? the question. Right. Yes, sir. Hello. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, uh, so it's a nice case uh, managed by Dr. Padmamalini. Uh, very nice documentation. And uh, I must say that I must, con must congratulate her for the good visual outcome. Uh, we know that the Bredom is a very rare entity in past 10 years. Uh, this must be our second case. The first one we published and after saying that patient had no malignancy and a couple of months later the patient comes with an intraocular lymphoma. While in this case the patient is already a known case of uh, malignancy and the patient was on uh, chemotherapy. Uh, then the oncologist decided to put the patient on immunotherapy based on the biopsy report and after four cycles of the immunotherapy the patient comes with uh, these findings. So well uh, uh, to debate on uh, let us divide the discussion into two parts. One is the uh, etiology and one is treatment. Can we? Can so, I request to stop sharing the screen, please? Uh, Dr. Atul, can you stop? Yeah. So uh, here we have three possibilities. One is the immune therapy, the pembrolizumab causing uveitis, which mimic the BDM findings. The second possibility, the immune therapy is not at all related to the findings what the patient had. Anyway, the patient would have developed this BDM because the patient had malignancy. And third, it's a combination of both. So uh, let us ask our panelists uh, uh, what they think about it. Uh, let me start with Dr. Pichi. Uh, can you share your thoughts on this case? What do you think? It's a 
pembrolizumab uh, or it's a uh, pedem the cancer causing the entity or it's a mixture of both i i don't think any of us can actually tell to me personally uh, the so the faf and the fa findings which are basically the negative of each other uh, they reflect b dump and b dump in this case uh, is associated with the uh, visceral carcinoma that the patient had right um, so i would go for uh, your second option uh, so a clear case, not a clear, but a case of B-dump secondary to the carcinoma. But I don't think I can actually rule out the other two. So, well, uh, uh, in my knowledge, uh, only two of such reports have been published. One was uh, one year back uh, in a journal of uh, oncology and pathology. So their patient also had uh, therapy with uh, pembrolizumab and the patient presented with the uh, B-dump finding. And the latest one is this year in month of June. Uh, yeah, so I must agree that uh, this pembrolizumab, whether it really causes the pan-uveitis, which mimic uh, beta findings, it's uh, not confirmed. Uh, yeah, Dr. Vishal, ma'am, yeah. Uh, we have Lucia with us. Let her share her experience and how at maths you would go about these patients, because that's what will be useful. Sure. So I think, uh, I mean, I agree. It's impossible to note definitively, but this is clearly B dump and whether the pembrolizumab had a role in it or not is unclear. Um, but I, I would lean towards thinking it did uh, given the temporal association. Um, also, we see this is a perineoplastic syndrome B dump and we see patients with melanoma associated retinopathy and cancer associated retinopathy who present immediately after getting the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So I think this is just an extension of the same um, same kind of syndrome or the same induced syndrome by the checkpoint inhibitors. Can so I ask in Lucia, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so no, go Lucia, ahead, please. Wh why do you think the VGF was so high? I, uh, I don't know. I, I think <laughs> that it's very, I mean, we could postulate many things. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure. I've never checked VGF levels or, or done anti-VEGF injections in VDUM patients. Because the so anti-VGF was actually, the anti-VGF was lower in the VGF, but not actually helping the patient. The, the, the OCT was not responding at all. Right, right. Mm. I mean, I think in these cases, there's a lot more going on. If the, even if the VEGF is, is abnormal, there's a lot more going on than that. And it's not primarily driven by the VEGF, the disease process. Yeah, I agree. So from my perspective, you the immune therapy in this patient? Yeah, can you... Uh, can you clarify the interferon? It was six times a day. I heard drops. Was it given topically? Is, did I understand uh, that? Yes. So uh, let us uh, talk about, yeah, let us discuss about the therapeutic part of this patient. So the patient uh, received chemotherapy. Then the patient was started on immunotherapy. Then we realized that it could be because of pembrolizumab or the cancer itself. Then the chemotherapy was stopped. And uh, then the patient received the steroid doses, no response or very poor response. Then the patient receives anti vegfs again, poor response. But during this time, the patient was restarted on the chemotherapy. And then uh, the topical interferon was introduced. So generally, we use topical interferon. I mean, we have recently started using it mainly for the pseudopathic CMEs. And this is for the first time uh, Dr. Padamani has used it for uh, this BDUM with uh, subretinal of fluid. So here we have to discuss whether the really it was an interferon uh, given topically, which has uh, improved the subretinal fluid or was it a chemotherapy which was restarted had a positive effect? I yeah, think I it's a combination of factors. The patient was on systemic steroids, systemic chemotherapy and have started acting along with topical interferon. But even after stopping the topical interferon also patient is doing well. So definitely systemic chemotherapy also plays a role. And, and do you, was there, a, obviously you used it for CME and that's well known. Um, in uveitis to use interferon for CME, but was there something specific that drove you to use it in this case where it's not really primary CME, uh, or was it just, you were just grasping to get something to try to help the patient? No, I'm curious this was if there was some thought. The CME was not at all coming down. So we tried, so as a additional option, I tried it in this case, it, it worked. Right. So well, I think she four, four times a day, I did not, then I stepped up to six with the six, I, I could see the drastic response in the reduction of the macular edema in this case. I think let's have now Marion's opinion. She has been trying to. 
No, I'm, I actually, um, regarding the case, um, I, I also agree from the pictures, it really looks like bee dump, but the, the vicinity in terms of the starting of the treatment from the checkpoint inhibitors kind of uh, looks like a combined role. Um, I actually have a question. So from my understanding, always what we know from these uh, MEC inhibitors and checkpoint inhibitors is that we have the, we have the mitogene activated protein kinase, uh, which kind of, uh, uh, which kind of um, is important for um, the tight junctions in the RPE. And um, it, it is believed that the MEC inhibitors kind of interfere then with the function of these, uh, of these kinase leading to kind of the accumulation of the subretinal fluid in the, in the retina. And, um, but from my understanding, if that is the underlying cause, then um, it always has to kind of um, resolve when we stop the treatment. And if we do not stop the treatment, uh, if we stop the treatment and we see a worsening or not an um, improvement of, uh, of these features, then there have to be another underlying cause kind of triggering the things we see in these patients. Or is there any other understanding of the cause cause relationship of the things we see um, in patients on MEC inhibitors and checkpoint inhibitors? I would say that it, that's generally true, but we certainly have cases where the inflammation persists after stopping the medication and is very severe. We also have had patients that stop the inhibitors. We treat them with steroids. They go away. And months later, off of any additional therapy, they have a recurrence of their inflammation similar to the initial one. So it's the temporal association is very helpful for stopping and seeing resolution, but it's not 100%. There are patients that buck that trend uh, over but time. But you can't and, be sure... But you can't be sure that this is then the underlying cause of the, the disease itself. Um, or that it's just, not, yes. yeah. I agree. Or it has just set off something different in the immune system. It's that's just no longer like a drug threshold driven. and now it's just yeah. dysfunctional. Yeah. I, yes. Uh, yeah. Well, the under, underlying cause is basically malignancy, which produces the CMAP factor. That's a cultured melanocyte proliferation factors. So if, uh, uh, if you will uh, wash it out after the, from the blood circulation by means of plasmapheresis, that will be the definitive treatment in such cases. So I think uh, in such cases, the treatment should be driven to control the main problem that is a malignancy. And this uh, venom finding will ultimately resolve once, the, once we treat the malignancy successfully. There is a comment, Ankush, uh, from Dr. Monsef, which I'll just read out, that they have published a study, a prospective diagnostic study published by their group, uh, distinct, distinguishing the sweat source optical OCT findings in active toxoplasmic retinal choroiditis, which shows that three OCT findings, including retinal hyperreflective round deposits, sublesional choroidal thickening, and sublesional retinal pigment epithelial elevation, are more likely to occur in OT patients as compared to the non OT patients. So I think this was related to the uh, mm -hmm. case which was sh shown by Padma. But there's another, uh, you know, comment by uh, Dr. Deepankar that was the choreo capillaries involved in both eyes OCT in this particular case and was it a small cell CA, non-small CA or an adenocarcinoma in the lung? Well, to answer the first question, uh, yes, of course, uh, the coronary involvement is more common in toxoplasmosis. What we published is a very rare finding. So over a period of past uh, uh, five to seven years, we had only 10 cases. So if you see the coronal elevation, of course, it's definitely common in case of toxoplasmosis, not in uh, ARN cases. So coronal finding what we described, that was without retinitis, and it's very rare. And this coronal finding, we uh, found increase in thickness of choroid when the lesion, that is a keratouveitis, whenever uh, what is active, when the keratouveitis is resolved, there was a scarring of the uh, coronal lesions. And think, second question, I think, uh, should be answered by Dr. Padma Amalini, as uh, it was her case. I think that was a... Uh, I didn't know carcinoma for... stage four was the lung CA. Let's move uh, on. Yeah, I'll take a last comment from Dr. Pichi. Uh, no, I actually have a question for Dr. Ankush. You, you think that the uh, dilated episclerar vessels and the iris atrophy that it was shown uh, was... Uh, uh, compatible with the case or just an, a, like a, an, a finding that had nothing to do with the, with the diagnosis? Uh, You're talking about the BDM case? Yeah. Uh, the patient came with anti uveitis The patient had circumcellular condition and the patient had diffuse KPs. I think uh, uh, Dr. Padmanam has seen uh, the patient, so I don't know about it, but whatever I uh, got from the slides, 
the patient also had a component of anti uveitis okay i'll just take a one quick comment from dr sanjay since he's been wanting to say and then probably we'll move on to the next case you're not audible dr sanjay can you hear me sir you're not audible dr sanjay yeah now yes am i audible now please go ahead. yes please go ahead yeah so i i had a patient with uh, advanced uh, renal cell carcinoma who was on uh, cabozantinib so this cabozantinib is one of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors which actually can cause uh, cystoid macular edema so my point of view is uh, the, we had actually stopped the cabozantinib but the patient uh, had a recurrent uh, cme and uh, this cme actually responded to topical interferon so we probably believe even though it's a single case we probably believe that uh, topical interferon in case of this uh, protein kinase inhibitors or tyrosine kinase inhibitors may have a role in actually resolving uh, cme thank you so i think we do have a few more questions but i would request the panelists to answer and let's move on to the next case now yeah let us the next case uh, that's going to be uh, the bug with mini masks yeah and, uh, will be moderated by dr sai bhakti uh, dr aditya please uh, our uh, julia fellow please uh, Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Aditya will present the next case in the grand rounds, and this is about the bug that has been seen more often in recent times with various pre presentations. Let us hear the story that he has to tell. Sure. I would first like to thank uh, the UIT Society of India for uh, giving me this opportunity, and I'm Dr. Aditya. My moderator is Dr. Namita. I'll be presenting the bug with many masks. At first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Padma Malini and Dr. K. S. Satish who have helped manage the case, and our other colleagues at Narayan Nidralay. I'll be presenting two cases. Let's go with the first one. The first one is a 36-year-old Caucasian male who was referred to our UVI test service with complaints of sudden onset defective vision in the left eye since one week. He had history of bilateral tinnitus and sensory neural hearing loss since two months, for which he was treated with a short course of oral steroids with no improvement. Uh, he had brought his old reports with him, which included an audiogram. The audiogram showed bilateral, moderate, high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, and a visual evoked potential report was normal. He also had a brain MRI done elsewhere, which was normal. Coming to the ocular examination, his vision, pupils, intraocular pressure were normal in both eyes. The color vision was normal. The extraocular movements were normal in both eyes. However, the ampulla charting revealed an inferonasal scotoma in the left eye. Coming to the anterior segment examination, in both eyes there were telangiectatic vessels on the lid margin. and the cornea was clear and there was mild conjunctival hyperemia in the left eye the anterior chamber was quiet and deep in both eyes there were traces of anterior vitreous cells in both eyes that is not seen on this image so coming to the fundus examination in the right eye we can see there was mild blurring of the disc margin and hyperemia with few hypopigmented spots in the fundus and in the far temporal periphery there is a white without pressure in the left eye there is disc edema with hyperemia and retinal vascular sheathing with hypopigmented lesions in the fundus also involving the macula so coming to ocular imaging we did b scan ultrasonography for this patient it revealed bilateral thickened choroids with normal optic nerve diameters fundus autofluorescence showed hyperautofluorescence in the right eye around the disc and in the left eye there was a patch of hyperautofluorescence in a triangular fashion involving the macula the oct scan revealed posterior vitreous cells in the right eye and in the left eye we could see posterior vitreous cells and in the outer retina there was intact elm disrupted ellipsoid zone and thickened and granular rpe at this stage our provisional diagnosis is bilateral posterior uveitis with hearing loss so our differentials are syphilis and vkh syphilis because of the triangular patch of choroid retinitis with outer retinal changes and disc edema and no response to the steroids and in the vkh because the patient had history of hearing loss and tinnitus with bilateral disease with choroidal thickening and disc edema so we ordered some lab tests that revealed the vdrl and tpha were positive and the erythrocyte sedimentation rate was elevated So to rule out VKH in this case, we did angiography. So the fluorescent angiogram, as we can see in the early phase, it shows hypofluorescence around the disc in the right eye and hypofluorescence in a triangular fashion in the left eye involving the macula. The same hypofluorescence had increased in the late phases. 
And the endocyanin green angiography revealed hypofluorescent dark dots in the both eyes, uh, in the posterior pole. And in the late phases, there was hypofluorescence around the disc in the right eye. And the left eye, the same triangular patch had hypofluorescence on ICGA with persistence of some uh, hypofluorescent dark dots in the late phases. Then the visual fields examination was done, 30-2. It revealed a central scotoma in the left eye and uh, non-specific defects in the right eye. Patient hence was referred to the neurologist to, uh, and CSLS ex uh, CNS examination was normal. Lumbar puncture was done, which revealed a normal CSF opening pressure. And the CSF analysis showed a mildly elevated protein and lymphocytes. The CSF VDRL was negative, thus ruling out neurosyphilis. Then patient was referred to the infectious disease specialist and was treated with intravenous aqueous crystalline penicillin G, 4 million units every 4 hours for 10 days, followed by oral doxycycline 100 milligrams twice daily for 14 days. From the eye point of view, we started him on topical nepaphenac eye drops and a steroid antibiotic combination in both eyes for 4 weeks in a tapering schedule. And we can see here in the seven weeks post-treatment, there was resolution of the posterior vitreous cells in the right eye. And in the left eye, we can see the outer retinal changes have been reversed. The fundus autofluorescence also showed regression of changes. The visual field effects had reversed and the uh, hearing loss had also reversed. So that's the first case. Now going on to the second case, we have a 49-year-old gentleman, driver by profession, who presented with complaints of redness, pain, and blurring of vision in the right eye since three months. Uh, he was treated elsewhere with uh, as a herpes simplex keratitis with uh, tablet acyclovir 400 milligrams and uh, acyclovir eye ointment with timolone and homatropine eye drops. At the second center, because of inadequate response, he was uh, treated as a varicella zoster keratitis with topical and oral steroids and acyclovir was stepped up to 800 milligrams. The, st still due to the inadequate response, patient presented to us. And uh, he had history of type 2 diabetes with poor glycemic control. His ocular examination was within normal limits. Uh, we can see here there was right eye diffuse anterior scleritis. And in the cornea, inferiorly, there was stromal haze and cellularity. And there was deep, some amount of deep stromal vascularization. So I apologize for the poor quality of this image because it was taken on a smartphone. But uh, here we can see the on the uh, cornea in the endothelium, there were keratic precipitates. And there was reduced corneal sensation in all four quadrants into the right eye. And also the right eye anterior chamber showed cells 1 plus and flare 1 plus. The left eye anterior segment was normal with normal corneal sensations. Coming to the fundus, the right eye had a fairly normal fundus with the white without pressure in the temporal periphery with some RP changes. In the left eye, the fundus showed multiple serous elevations at the posterior pole with a yellowish deep retinal lesion along the inferotemporal arcade. And in the inferotemporal quadrant, we could see that there was retinal vascular sheathing with hemorrhages. His, he had brought his old reports, which revealed an elevated total leukocyte count, an elevated exocyte sedimentation rate, and the blood sugars were deranged. His HSV 1 and 2 IgG was positive. However, the IgM was negative, and a MANTU test revealed uh, 14 millimeters of induration, uh, but the chest X-ray was normal. At this stage, we have a right eye diffuse anterior scleritis with interstitial keratitis and anterior uveitis. And in the left eye, we have retinal vasculitis with multifocal CSCR. Our possible etiologies include tuberculosis, viral, and syphilis and other possibilities like sarcoidosis. Coming to ocular imaging, the anterior segment OCT revealed hyperreflectivity within the corneal stroma, suggestive of interstitial keratitis, and the sclera also showed thickening along with hyperreflective spaces. We performed confocal imaging to no visualize the subbasal nerve plexus in the right eye where the corneal sensations were decreased. We could see that there was reduced density of the corneal nerves in the subbasal plexus as compared to the left eye. Now, in the OCT scanning, which was done in the, along the lesion in the inferotemporal arcade, it revealed subretinal hyperreflective material along with the serous, uh, serous uh, pigment epithelial detachment. This was the appearance, which we would like to call the eye within the eye appearance of the lesion. And uh, coming to the fundus fluorescent angiogram, it revealed early hypo and late hyperfluorescence with ink blot appearance in both eyes, suggestive of multifocal CSCR. And in the late phases, we could see in the right eye, in the temporal periphery, there was a hyperfluorescence corresponding to the areas of the white without the pressure. And in the left eye, there was a vasculitic leak in the inferotemporal periphery. So we have got some lab reports done and it revealed a positive VDRL and TPHA. And hence the patient was referred to the infectious disease specialist to start the antisyphilitic treatment. From the eye point of view in the right eye where the sclerocarotiveitis was there, we started him on topical uh, prednisolone and homatropine eye drops. And in the left eye where we had the, the retinal vasculitis with multifocal CSCR, we started with topical NSAIDs along with systemic NSAIDs. Four weeks later, patient had already completed eight doses of benzathine penicillin, 1.2 million units intramuscular. Since the patient hailed from a rural area, he was uh, and he chose to take treatment locally. He could not receive intravenous penicillin due to lack of facilities. However, the, despite the IM penicillin, we can see there was some resolution of the serious elevations in the posterior pole. And on this OCT image, we can see at four weeks the subretinal hyperreflective material had reduced. 
and the, uh, there was disappearance of the eye within the eye appearance. Further, patient was advised to continue eight more injections of benzathine penicillin. And we can see at the eight week follow up, right eye showed a resolving anterior scleritis. And there was some area of scleral thinning in the superonasal and nasal quadrant. There was resolution of keratic precipitates, and the interstitial keratitis had also healed with cicatrization. In the fundus, the right eye, the fundus was normal. In the left eye, the serous elevations had resolved. We can see in the infratemporal quadrant also, there was a resolution of retinal vascular sheathing following penicillin therapy. And uh, the anterior seg segment OCT confirmed our findings. There was scarification in the right eye corneal stroma, and the scleral thickening had also resolved. In this OCT image, we can see that uh, at the first visit, four weeks and eight weeks follow up, how the subretinal hyperreflective material has resolved. And um, then we performed corneal nerve fiber analysis using the confocal microscopy to, anal because, uh, to analyze the subbasal nerve plexus. And we saw that the corneal nerve fiber length had improved. The corneal nerve fiber area had improved along the fractal dimension. There was improvement in the nerve fiber morphology in the subbasal plexus. And there was some improvement also in the corneal sensation. So the purpose of presenting these two cases is to highlight the various clinical features of ocular syphilis with imaging signs, such as the triangular patch of chorioretinitis in the first case and the sclerokeratoeuveitis with interstitial keratitis in the second case, and to highlight the reversal of hearing loss and restoration of corneal sensation in syphilitic keratoeuveitis following treatment. Also, the association of CSCR with syphilis has been rarely reported in literature. At this stage, I would like to ask our respected panelists, uh, in, ca in cases of uveitis with interstitial keratitis, how do you differentiate between viral, syphilis, and TB etiologies? And how do you manage cases of retinal vasculitis with CSCR? And when to start steroids in a case of syphilitic uveitis associated with CSCR? Thank you. Thank you, Aditya. Yeah, to address now our uh, first question that we have is uh, to look for, uh, to dis uh, differentiate the various etiologies uh, causing interstitial keratitis. That is viral, syphilitic, tubercular, et cetera. So uh, I'd like to ask some of our, pa our panelists their uh, opinion on this. I think we're all silent because we're retina specialists. And so we, we, uh, we don't, we, <laughs> We, uh, we leave it to our cornea uh, colleagues to often uh, give us guidance about, about the cornea. I, don't, I, per, I personally don't know um, any pearls for distinguishing um, between the, two, the etiologies. Okay. The if, if, uh, most I... often when we have an HSV-related uh, interstitial keratitis, we normally have them as unilateral involvements they bear with uh, diffuse or sectorial involvement. And uh, like even in this case, you also have a decreased corneal sensation, right? And along with it, we find other involvement of the anterior segment uh, findings of anterior uveitis or dendrit uh, dendritic ulcers if there's keratitis or there's anterior uveitis or endothelitis. This would uh, clinch the diagnosis, suggesting a HSV uh, as the involvement of uh, uh, interstitial keratitis. And in syphilitic, uh, mostly in cases of secondary syphilis, you find them. And there is pro the new vascularization that is seen in these cases uh, would be much more compared to the others, sometimes even producing what we call as a salmon patch kind of uh, thing because of the extensive uh, neovascularization. Anybody else has anything else to I, add on? I would like I think for me, since Dr. PK has done a lot of work on syphilis, I would like to hear from his comment, opinion. Yes, but as Lucia was saying, I've done work on syphilis in the back of the eye. So, and uh, so when everything is in the front, it scares me. But so the second case, the interstitial keratitis case, was a very nice catch. So I have to say what I've learned from uh, dealing with uveitis is that we cannot really, um, uh, we cannot categorize everything. So it would be great if we had uh, uh, clear signs of uh, interstitial keratitis that points towards HSV, TB or syphilis, but unfortunately we don't. Um, as we were saying, uh, maybe HSV is the easiest one to detect because it comes sometimes with endothelitis, sometimes there's a clear dendritis, but we always have to suspect syphilis and TB. Um, and um, to, to go to the back of the eye, the first case was a very nice case. The right eye, uh, the lesion around the optic nerve could have fooled me. 
Um, in the left eye, the triangular shape, yes, uh, it should make you suspect of uh, syphilis, especially on OCT with the RP changes, uh, the RP modeling. Um, and uh, I'm uh, curious to see what the other panelists think of the uh, central series like with a lot of fibrin in the second case. Because I'm not sure that the corridor was super thick uh, under the, that lesion. So um, let, let's hear from the other as well. Wasn't the uh, RPE detachment clinching the diagnosis for a CSCR there? But sometimes an RPE detachment is just an RPE detachment. Just an no, but the FFA was diagnostic. FFA showed the uh, in blood sign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it was only on. I also had a patient of VKH with RP detachment who received steroids and went into full blown CAC. So once you have an ink blood sign on fluorescein angiography, steroids will be no forever. You have to resort to something else. So there is no question of timing. Regarding, I don't do interstitial keratitis, but to me it's very simple that both for syphilis and for TB, we need the labs to be positive to start the treatment. So if the test for the syphilis are positive, it's syphilis. If the test for TB are positive, it's TB. And if I'm in doubt, I just do PCR, like Francesco said that there is endotheliitis. Because to be very honest with you, my cornea colleagues do not give me that kind of confocal where I can make the diagnosis. So I rely on more humble, uh, you, you know, labs and others. The problem in such cases will arrive uh, if the patient develops Yarish has some reaction. And then you are in catch. The patient has got uh, CSCR, patient has got syphilis. Yes. And you know, that the patient with you. you know, I'm very impressed with interferons. You can. <laughs> right. In, yeah, in this particular yeah. case, the endothelial deposits were different, and also the corneal sensation in viral, more of anterior stromal will get involved. Here, the mid stromal and the deep stromal was involved. So, it's interstitial keratitis is going more in favor of syphilis than in case of viral in this case. And clinically, the absent viral decreased sensation, it came back to normal. Sometimes it's so the complete important. reversal without an antiviral therapy happened in this case. And also very important to look at the opposite eye. You may get certain clues of the etiology from the eye that apparently appears normal. Uh, but it's always very important to look at that eye. For any yeah. Well, I think the great imitator should be uh, differentiated uh, by means of blood test only. Because Absolutely. it can mimic anything like TB, uh, uh, sarcoid, or any uh, viral uh, infection, it can mimic. So, yes. the, since we have the gold standard test like TPHA, we have to rely on that. Right. To Francesco's question, I mean, I, I, I don't know if those OCTs so, were done EDI, so maybe, but I, I agree so that the, the uh, next interesting uh, presentation. Yeah, sorry, can we hear what Lucia was saying? Yes, Lucia, please go on. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I, 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 I do agree it was probably CSR, given the steroids he was on, and also the multifocal in both eyes and the PED, all that suggested CSR. I would say, um, to answer the last question, uh, you don't always have to do steroids, and you always have PDT with CSR. So, I mean, so you have those options as well. And not all cases of syphilis need steroids along with the penicillin treatment. So the moving on to the next case, uh, the title, uh, Insert Over Grave Injury. Uh, Dr. Sanjay will be moderating this case and will be presented by Dr. Isha. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ankush. Um, in 2021, uh, India was uh, struck by a second wave of uh, COVID and uh, we had a mini epidemic of uh, also mucormycosis. So this case, uh, shows you some of the interesting features what we had in this patient. Dr. Isha, please. Dr. Isha? Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Is my, am I audible? Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, respected panelists and the moderators. 
Uh, I would like to thank uh, USI for providing me the opportunity to present at the USI Grand Rounds. And I shall be presenting a challenging case of insult over grave injury. So these are my acknowledgements. So at the outset, I would like to show you a little story about our patient, what happened three months back from presentation. So, so this was our patient. And this is what he underwent. So yeah, so he presented three months back from the day of presentation and uh, three months back he had COVID-19 infection and was hospitalized and was given oxygen supplementation and intense dexamethasone therapy. And after that, 19 days later, he had right eye orbital pain, periorbital pain, and uh, black HR was noted in the right nostrils. And right eye was apparently normal at that time. Even the left eye was normal. And he was referred to ENT. So MRI was done at that time. And it was, he was diagnosed with rhinoorbital mucormycosis. And RBS was around 325 mg per deciliter. And he was rece he received injection liposomal amphotericin B with tablet posaconazole 300 mg for a month. He also underwent endoscopic sinus surgery and right eye orbital exenteration. At that time, the histopathology showed that it was an invasive mucormycosis with angioinvasion and thromboembolism. So at presentation to us, he had blurring of vision in left eye since two days. He was a known diabetic since four years and presently controlled on oral hypoglycemic agents. There was no evidence of hypertension, cardiac or renal disease or anemia. So examination of right socket showed healthy MP socket. An examination of the left eye showed a best corrected visual acuity of 2030 in the left eye. Anterior segment was normal except the early posterior subcapsular cataract. And posterior segment showed these multiple cotton wool spots and dot blot hemorrhages at the posterior port. Intraocular pressure was normal. On SDOCT, it was noted that increased hyperreflectivity and distortion of inner and middle retinal layers is there. Uh, it is just juxtafovial and some cystoid spaces were also seen. On the multicolor imaging, pseudocolor reflectance showed greenish lesion corresponding to retinal opacification at macula, and blue reflectance showed bright white lesions corresponding to cotton wool spots, while the infrared reflectance showed dark lesion corresponding to this retinal opacification. On FFA, the arm to retina time was 20 seconds, which was not delayed. And in the early phases, we can see that there was a block fluorescence in the area corresponding to that retinal opacification. And in the later stages, we could see that there are capillary non-perfusion areas and perivascular leaks. This is the FFA montage image. And in this, we can see that there is no evidence of neovascularization elsewhere or any disc leak. These were the systemic investigations. And the relevant investigations showed an increased ESR of 25 mm per hour serum ferritin of 420.4 and SARS-CoV-2 antibodies IgG was found to be reactive. Rest, we ruled out tuberculosis by MAN2 and chest X-ray being normal. Tri-dot HIV-1-2 screening was also non-reactive and autoimmune profile including ANN and CN cover also negative. So on treatment, uh, we started the patient on topical diflupredinate 0.05% QID and oral prednisolone was started after physician clearance, which was 40 mg OD with uh, tapering doses with oral calcium and omeprazole. So oral prednisolone was continued for three and a half months. And this was the picture at three and a half months. There was some increase in the cotton wool spots. However, uh, the dot blot hemorrhages had reduced and even the uh, retinal opacification at the macula had also reduced. BCV improved to 2020, and at one year, we can see there is a drastic decrease in the cotton wool spots as well as the hemorrhages. This was the follow-up OCT image, where the, uh, at three and a half months, we can see that the thinning is noted at the area of uh, retinal opacification, which further reduced at one year. And this is the FFA image in which we can see that capillary non-perfusion areas had reduced at three and a half months, but there was drastic reduction in at one year. But still some areas of CNP areas, perivascular staining was seen. So these are the comparison pictures where we can see that earlier there was a, a retinal opacification at the macula, which reduced and further decreased at one year, but there were cotton wool spots that increased at three and a half months. 
However, there was retinal thinning noted at the macular area. So these were the differential diagnoses that we could think of. It could have been either a COVID-19 microangiopathy, COVID-19 mucor mycosis associated vasculitis, or is it a moderate NPDR, post-fever retinitis, or can it be a personalist retinopathy? That's all we could think of. So these are the questions to the panelist as what is the probable etiology of inflammation in left eye? What are the risks of starting steroids in a patient with a recent history of COVID-19 infection and mucormycosis? Is there a role of starting immunosuppressants at one year? Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Isha. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. Yeah. So th this was a quite challenging case uh, where uh, we had uh, some kind of inflammation. Patient was uh, symptomatic and uh, we had to do something. So the challenge of uh, starting steroids in a patient who had just uh, uh, recovered from uh, mucor mycosis uh, could be quite challenging. So in consultation with the uh, infectious disease uh, specialist, we did uh, start the steroids and the uh, patient symptomatically improved and also his vision also improved. So I'd like to uh, invite the panelists to give their uh, views on this uh, patient. Um, I may start here. So just some thoughts from my side. So first of all, um, I, the patient had high ferritin, I think, which is which is always together with DDMER an independent risk factor in order um, in terms of the severity of COVID. And we also know that patients who have diabetes and had COVID or have COVID are more prone to um, to a mycomycosis. I think from the presentation of the patient and considering the severe presentation of COVID, um, the changes seen in the eye could be due to COVID itself or due to the mucormycosis. Probably it would have been you know, a combination of all of it. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I would rule out is the moderate NPDR because uh, the at one year there was a resolution of the uh, areas of uh, non-perfusion, so we should rule out that one. But I completely agree with Marion. Probably microangiopathy second to COVID or uh, associated with mucormycosis as well. Had his other eye, his the eye that didn't get exonerated, had it been examined while he was in the hospital? Were these changes acute or not acute? Does it, or do we have any sense? That would be helpful. Um, we actually uh, had a normal, uh, uh, when he had a HR in the right nostril, uh, he had an examination and apparently it was noted that uh, both eyes were normal. So after that, uh, probably there was a, a patient developed uh, all this uh, signs and symptoms uh, two days um, uh, of duration and uh, it was uh, about 19 days after the exoneration. So probably I would uh, reckon that it's an acute phase uh, changes probably on top of uh, probably he might be having a mild NPDR uh, which uh, probably worsened and uh, mostly I would uh, think that it could be related to COVID because uh, we have seen many patients uh, having this uh, asculopathy kind of uh, changes. The challenge was uh, whether to start steroids again or not in a patient who had already lost another eye because of uh, steroids. So that was the challenging uh, part. And uh, fortunately for us, uh, he got better. And uh, now at the end of uh, year, uh, about last week, uh, I had to recall him back. And he still had those uh, uh, CNP areas with my leak. So patient is not symptomatic right now. Should we consider starting him on immunosuppression or we just follow him up? I would just follow him. I don't think his disease is severe enough to warrant immunosuppression at all. Yeah. When we Especially talk considering the mucormycosis in the background, I would be really very, very careful. Uh, you can you can uh, monitor it even on angiographically, the wide field angiography, maybe every six monthly if the patient is asymptomatic, but I would not really go for immunosuppression. Uh, any thoughts on the purchase retinopathy in this case as the patient has undergone the major surgery that's a uh, excentration? Uh, anybody thinks in that time? Purchase should have shown uh, very classically on angiography. Your angiography was not truly very highly suggestive of purchase. And uh, what you are showing, few things are delayed. Purchase is not a delayed phenomenon, it's a huge process. And but I the history was of two days. The patient came with a history of two days and the previous examination which was done during the examination was reportedly normal. So okay. I don't know. 
actually whether uh, parsner's uh, retinopathy could it be induced by this uh, excentration surgery itself so that was one of the other uh, thoughts we had so because uh, if you have fracture of uh, long bones uh, we notice that uh, we can get uh, parsner's retinopathy so whether this uh, extensive uh, excentration process whether it induced all these changes so that is one uh, moot point we will probably need to think over So we'd like to hear from Dr. J.B. sir. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. Uh, Dr. Padmani, you wanted to add something? No, I would like to get Dr. Biswas' opinion regarding this case. Uh, I'm not sure about that COVID causing, sorry, uh, mucor causing retinal vasculitis. Mm, uh, I'm not sure, very sure. Uh, there is no mucormycosis induced uh, uh, ophthalmic uh, vasculitis has been reported so far. Uh, mucormycosis actually causes uh, angio invasion. So that is one of the possibilities we were considering. But whether to uh, whether we will be able to prove whether mucor caused it or not is uh, again uh, very difficult to say. You know, Sanjay, to be very practical, if mucor caused it or your exentration caused it, it will be a one-time event. It will not progress. Yes. So I will not go crazy investigating it. If it progresses, then it means it's not caused by mucor. Then you need to look at other things like auto-inflammatory syndromes and others and others which are being reported following the COVID. But for the time being, I think we would all agree that we don't have to do anything active, start on any kind of immunosuppression. Thank you, Prof. Gupta. Okay, so with that, uh, let us move on to our last case. Uh, the title is Tom, Dick, Harry and the Jack. Uh, uh, it will be moderated by Dr. Sai Bhakti and uh, uh, Dr. Prashanti will present it. Uh, Dr. Prashanti, can you share your slides? Yes, please. Slideshow. Uh, good evening, one and all. And uh, good morning to the panelists uh, joining us from uh, the other side of the globe. Uh, my presentation today is titled Tom, Dick, Harry, and Jack, Who Came to the Rescue? Uh, so the patient was a 43-year-old South Asian female dentist by profession who came to us with uh, chief complaints of pain, photophobia, redness in both eyes, and gradual blurring of vision in both eyes since two years. She is a known case of rheumatoid arthritis and central diabetes insipidus on treatment with uh, desmopressin. Uh, this patient was treated at multiple centers, both in the US and in India, with an extensive clinical history. So center one, which was in the US, was where she was diagnosed as uh, bilateral necrotizing scleritis, secondary to rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, was treated with multiple immunomodulatory therapy, ranging from systemic steroids, methotrexate, mycophenolate, mofetil, cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide, and also biologics, including infliximab and adalimumab but uh, there was no uh, satisfactory response. And uh, there were choroidal granulomas, so they suspected uh, a TB and started her on ATT and uh, oral antifungal therapy. Uh, despite all of this, there was a progression of necrosis, so they went ahead and did a right eye scleral patch graft and was then referred to India. So in India, at center two, again, an extensive workup was done. Uh, all the infections were ruled out, right eye, AC tap, scraping over necrotic sclera, Quantiferon TB gold, all of which were negative. RA factor, ANA, C anka were negative again. And she was given a pulse steroid therapy and cyclophosphamide, following which uh, there was no improvement. So the patient was then sent to a rheumatologist. And then the rheumatologist referred her to our center, which was center three. Uh, by the time she came to us, uh, she had a Cushingoid appearance. She was on anti-glaucoma medication, uh, ATT, and uh, oral prednisolone, 40 milligrams once a day. So this was how the patient presented to us. 
uh, the vision in the right eye was 648 and uh, IOP was uh, 14 millimeters of um, uh, mercury. And as you can see on diffuse illumination in the supranasal quadrant, there is extensive thinning of sclera and also necrosis of the patch graft or over the prolapsed uveal tissue. And in the cornea, we can see uh, PUK scars uh, highlighted by the circles. And there is a posterior synechia at seven o'clock position and a few KPs were noted on the endothelium of the cornea. In the left eye, the vision was counting fingers two meters and the pressure was 16 mmHg. And there were multiple areas of scleral thinning with uveal uh, show in the supranasal, supratemporal, and temporal quadrant with a few KPs and pigments on the anterior lens capsule. There was also complicated cataract in this patient. We went ahead and did an ASOCT. So in the right eye, there was a localized uh, thickening of the sclera with multiple hyporeflective uh, spaces. Also in the left eye, we noted these hyporeflective spaces, which are uh, suggestive of necrosis. Uh, on posterior segment examination in the right eye, there was vitreous haze, the disc was hyperemic, and we noted a well-circumscribed yellowish-white subretinal nodular uh, lesion uh, in the right eye, in the supranasal quadrant. Coming to the left eye, there was again vitreous haze and a hyperemic disc, and a similar lesion was noted in the infrotemporal quadrant with uh, surrounding uh, subretinal fluid and a few uh, pigment epithelial changes in the nasal quadrant. On uh, B-scan ultrasonography of this patient, uh, a hyperechoic nodular lesion was noted with uh, subtenons fluid in both eyes. And uh, on doing an OCT through the lesion, in the right eye, uh, there were vitreous cells, there was altered retinal architecture and choroidal elevation was seen. Whereas in the left eye, again, there were vitreous cells, subretinal fluid and subretinal hyperreflective material was noted. On OCT through the macula, in the right eye, we can see intraretinal cystic spaces and RP undulation. And in the left eye, there was subretinal fluid. We have done all the basic investigations, uh, but the only uh, positive uh, outcome was on HRCT, we saw there was bilaterally enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. Uh, so she was sent to the pulmonologist and an endobronchial ultrasonography was done, which came out negative for TB and other infections. Uh, serum ACE levels were normal and MRI, PET scan, MRI and PET scan were done to rule out any malignancy or uh, masquerade, which was again normal. So uh, to rule out the infective etiology, we have done an AC tab for uh, Mycobacterium TB, UBAT, fan fungal, viral genome, QTB gold, EBUS, blood culture, all of which came out to be negative. RA factor, ANA, Cianca, anti-CCP, and serum A's were either negative or within normal limits. So we then went ahead and stepped up the oral prednisolone to 60 milligrams OD. And uh, on consultation with the pulmonologist, uh, we started her on levofloxacin 500 milligrams BD in addition to ATT uh, in view of uh, partial response. So in spite of starting this medication, there was not much difference in her condition that we could see. So we went ahead and did a literature search. So we saw that in refractory rheumatoid arthritis cases, JAK inhibitors are being used. And uh, they are being used also as an adjunct in uh, tubercular, uh, tuberculosis. So we went ahead and started the patient on baricitinib, four milligrams once daily on 15th March. Uh, she came back to us on 19th March with a breakthrough bleed in the left eye. Uh, and also there was a macular edema in the right eye. And in the left eye, there was subfovial neurosensory detachment. So we went ahead and uh, gave an intravitreal anti-VEGF with moxifloxacin on uh, 31st March in the left eye, following which there was um, exacerbation of inflammation and also the size of the lesion increased uh, uh, by a small amount. So we stepped up the topical and systemic steroids, after which uh, there was resolution of the inflammation. So the next follow-up, uh, when she came to us, she gave us a history of fall following which she sustained a left subtrochantric fracture and she had to undergo an internal fixation for that. So during this period, uh, they had stopped baricitinib for a period of two weeks and she was maintained on um, oral, uh, low dose oral steroids. So she came with worsening of the condition, both in the posterior segment as well in the anterior segment. Uh, so we advised her to restart baricitinib and stepped up the steroids. In the month of July, she consulted an infectious disease specialist and um, all the infections were ruled out once again. And uh, she was advised to continue baricitinib four milligrams once daily. 
So on her last follow-up with us, as you can see, there was a significant reduction in the size of the lesion in the right eye as well as, well as in the left eye. Uh, but there was recurrence of edema in uh, both right eye and left eye. So after a detailed discussion with the rheumatologist, um, we advised her to take tocilizumab since ATT was uh, stopped by then. Uh, but unfortunately, she had to leave for the US at this point. So uh, she went to the US and uh, she received tocilizumab. And these are the fundus pictures uh, post-treatment yeah. with tocilizumab. So as you can see, there was a dramatic improvement in the uh, lesion. There you can see uh, that it is healing in both the eyes. Uh, and this is a summary. Uh, so she was a case of rheumatoid arthritis with necrotizing scleritis in both eyes. Uh, she was on multiple immunomodulatory therapy with no satisfactory response. Uh, scleral patch grafting was done uh, because of um, uh, the necrosis. And uh, she then developed nodular posterior scleritis in both her eyes. She was on ATT, systemic steroids. Then there was worsening in the condition. After extensive literature review, she was started on baricitinib, 4 milligrams, for which uh, she started to respond. But again, we had a setback because of the uh, intravitreal injection and the trauma. So she stopped baricitinib, which was then restarted. Then again, we saw an improvement in her findings. Uh, meanwhile, the ATT was stopped since she treated a year and then she had to leave for the US where Dr. Rao and Dr. Wong uh, uh, promptly took up the case and started her on tocilizumab, after which finally we saw a, a satisfactory response. Uh, so I would uh, like to acknowledge Dharmanan and Dr. Padmamal for uh, handling such a challenging case and Dr. Rao and Dr. Wong for promptly taking up the case and giving her the best outcome possible. My questions to the panel are, uh, what could be the probable underlying etiology in this case? Any suggestions on an alternative approach that could have been taken in this particular scenario? Um, opinion on safety of baricitinib in patients with uh, suspected TB with rheumatoid arthritis? And uh, is there any implication of diabetes insipidus in the eye? Thank you. So uh, this was definitely a one of those cases which uh, pose not only a diagnostic conundrum, but also a very therapeutically challenging uh, place to be. And uh, this patient has received multiple immunosuppressive uh, agents for the treatment of uh, for this crisis. Neither could we you know, come to a diagnosis of the etiology or find a treatment that could safely reduce the inflammation of the sclera, both anterior and posterior. So with this, I would like to take the opinion of the panel with their experience, uh, any clues that they have seen in the, you know, the form of the anterior scleritis or the posterior scleritis, which could give clues whether this could be an infection or an inflammation, or uh, even to find out uh, changes that would suggest uh, control of the inflammation or at least moderate control. Uh, yeah, so uh, anybody from the panel could, you know, start with uh, what could be the probable etiology? Was it initially uh, infection or inflammation? If I may start, I have to say I really admire the consistency, consistency with which you looked for infections, because this really in the beginning looked like an infection to me. And uh, uh, I really, really kudos to you for keep looking for infection in this case. Um, when every, every infection is ruled out at this point, uh, I agree with the final diagnosis. Uh, but even looking at the first OCT you showed us, I would have sworn this was some kind of infection, but um, apparently not. So very, very nice case. Congratulations. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo what Francesco said. I mean, incredibly challenging. You handled it perfectly. You know, don't respond, rule out infection again, you know, and you d went all the way endoscopical, you know, endobronchial biopsy. You really chased everything down as well as you could. And I think the proof is in the pudding at the end, the tocilizumab is melting everything away. So I think a unifying diagnosis is exactly correct, uh, but uh, an amazing heroic case for this woman uh, to save her eyesight. 
I agree. Actually, in the beginning, I was thinking, okay, did you de did you do an uh, um, ELI spot um, instead of doing again the quantiferone? Did you rule out that you may have like um, um, drug resistant TB being present here? Because especially because it was like necrotizing scleritis, I was really thinking it it must be it must be something um, something infectious. But uh, you know, you've proven otherwise. Uh is there uh, yes, at any point of time uh, possibility of uh, considering Dr. Padma? Is there any possibility Please, at any ahead. point of time uh, to consider uh, pulsing this uh, patient with uh, IV steroids or uh, did you also think of uh, considering uh, cyclophosphamide since the infection was uh, ruled out and the uh, Inflammation was uh, quite severe. So this particular so patient, a... Abbas, received a couple of times intravenous lethal prednisolone, and she had two cycles of cyclophosphamide that definitely worsened the situation as per the patient. It was not put and okay, earlier centers they have put it, but as per the patient's report, she was a dentist, so her, she was not able to practice and really like she was, what we could do is we could stabilize the necrotic progression and she got back her vision 636 when she left India. Uh, right now, she's stabilized and working in for some insurance company. She's due coming for follow-up next month, so we'll be able to update. Hopefully, the lesions should have regressed even better. Because of the necrotizing scleritis, the local injections or any surgical intervention was ruled out in this case. The baricitinima was really stabilized her condition, I can say. Uh, may, may I ask, um, may, uh, please, sorry. Uh, Dr. Damananda, please. So th thank you. Thank you for uh, presenting this uh, wonderful, uh, yes. I should not say, uh, very welcome, difficult. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dharmanan is a rheumatologist. He is the handle this case and he's the one who started this patient on baricitinumab. So we just finished the case presentations. So you're welcome to take your input, sir. Yeah. So this patient was one of the most difficult patients I have seen because she had received almost all the possible immunosuppressive therapy, which is uh, routinely given in a patient with rheumatoid and scleritis. She has received uh, um, cyclophosphamide. She had did multiple courses of steroid. She was very pushing out. So the idea is to keep her uh, steroid low because she was already getting enough of side effects with uh, steroid. She has already had uh, hip fractures. So we were trying all the possible uh, methods because anti-tuberculosis treatment was there. That is the reason we chose baricitinib over tofacitinib because tofacitinib uh, won't be very effective when somebody is on uh, anti-tubercular treatment, particularly rifampicin. And um, she did show a response and Dr. Padma wonderfully managed her eye inflammation. We could keep the steroid down. And ultimately, she, she did well with tocilizumab. And we were always scared of uh, some occult infection, which are a malignancy lurking and uh, evading our uh, investigation, investigator and ability to diagnose. Dr. Thank you. Thank you for involving me in this case. Thank you. Dr. Dharmanan, thank you very much. There is a question for you from the audience. Could you have considered rituximab before tocilizumab? She, uh, I, I'm not sure. I think she, I, 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 at this moment, I received, can't comment. I don't remember, but she might have received rituximab already. Yes. She received rituximab in the past, ma'am. Okay, that answers the question. Adalimumab, infliximab, rituximab was given. So two TNFs, uh, one B-cell therapy, and she was on a 50-60 milligram steroids, and uh, when she came, it ended tubercular treatment. I think she had completed two full ATT, uh, if I'm right. And one, in the, one, one in the uh, United States and one here. Did we look for anti-drug antibodies against adalubimab, which could be the reason of non-responsiveness? Must be, must be one of the rare autoimmune diseases where uh, they refract to everything. Maybe anti because we can't really, she did not respond at all to anti tnf It's a primary failure. So okay. probably the immune mechanism itself was not TNF driven, probably. It is predominantly IL-6 driven end of the day. But 
we would have expected that is the reason i think paracetinib gave her a reasonable relief because one of the cytokine which are tackled by paracetinib is uh, il6 i have um, uh, when you show the fundus i have three patients so they did not have anterior scleritis but they were positive for atypical mycobacterium and we ended up giving them clarithromycin and the treatment so would you consider the test for tb were positive could it be atypical mycobacterium rather than the tb itself because you did have to give anti tb twice and uh, i'm just thinking aloud i, I don't know and it it was definitely thought about dr padma was looking for uh, it and we have a pulmonologist looking for that so uh, we were looking thinking about it because of refractory na uh, nature of her disease only steroids seem to have helped her uh, none of the other immunosuppressives she had received did not help her so fortunately it was uh, the testosterone which did that trick so, i have a comment i had the chance of seeing this patient <clears throat> i thought that this uh, choroidal lesion is not due to the rheumatoid arthritis i thought that it is a secondary to the treatment which has received the immunosuppressive agents develop some kind of an infective etiology probably typical or atypical mycobacteria so i was all the time looking for uh, the infective etiology in this case so the chronology could be autoimmune to begin with you treat with immunosuppression then yes. infection sets in and then we increase the immunosuppression infection is not responding then we treat the infection it somehow responds but the autoimmune component flares up and then we give tocilizumab i don't know it's a very interesting case yes lucy so about tocilizumab yeah no i i No, I was just going to say exactly what uh, Dr. Gupta just said, which is it's so difficult in this case to know for sure because um, the treatments were ongoing. Uh, but clearly, at the end, there was an autoimmune component. So, well, one of the OCT scan uh, did show a subretinal thick uh, fibrinous membrane. I don't know whether uh, is it the same thing what we see as a uh, shrum. subretinal hyperreflective membrane in tuberculosis or was it a different that's one thought came to my mind uh, i missed it ankush you are asking could it be subretinal hyperreflective membrane? yeah because the oct scan done over the lesion it did show very thick uh, subretinal membrane if the presenter can go back to the slide uh, one of the oct scan it was visible that there's a thick uh, subretinal membrane uh, sitting just over the lesion the ct scan but you did give her anti bgf along with moxiflox you know in between i did hear that but was it not we did give but following subsequent to that there was an increase we tried to an inflammatory yeah. reaction and so the oh, external inflammation at the site of injection because of that we could not continue the injection you know there could be a component of membrane in this hyperreflective material uh but for that you know that needs to be treated with the addition of anti vegf but the treatment has to continue because she also has vitreitis and the presence of vitreitis means that even if there is a underlying membrane it is coexisting in the active condition it's not responsible for all the features so you got to combine anti vegf but you also need to anti inflammatory here because right eye has very active cells in the vitreous well very interesting case so that proves that the jack inhibitor the, that proves the superiority of the jack over tom dick and harry i so, think lucia can uh, answer it better but as far as i know jack inhibitor trial has been prematurely terminated in us so maybe lucia or marian will have more idea about it yeah i don't have any insider information unfortunately about it um but i mean certainly people are using it off label and having some success uh in individual cases um so i think 
even yeah, if the trial doesn't show to be positive, I think there is a role yeah. for it in, in uveitis. Juan talked about it during ISO, and he did mention openly that the trial has been prematurely terminated, though he did say it was not due to the side effects, but it was due to overall something, but, you know, no comments. <laughs> We are finding so actually, it effective in pediatric uveitis, and Jack is doing wonders, except in viral infection, we have to be careful. Otherwise, whatever the short-term results we are having, the results are very satisfactory, including in pediatric age group. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much more cost-effective uh, because our patients do not have insurance and they have to pay out of the pocket. Uh, biologics are very expensive, but these are oral easy compliance, pretty cheap compared to, but I think herpes remains the main risk. So rheumatologists are not always very forthcoming in starting it. You've got to keep pushing them, but we don't know the long-term effects and all. We are just learning quite a few things. And the more you learn, the more scared you feel of treating your patients with these newer agents, you know? Dr. Daman, we would like to hear from you, sir, regarding the jack and its efficacy in autoimmune diseases from Indian perspective. The jack by concept, because it is a small molecule and it works intracellularly, so it is like a pan and multiple cytokine inhibitors. So, so it can have uh, effect on multiple immune pathways. That's why it can be like a, a broad spectrum immunomodulator like a broad spectrum antibiotics we have. Jack inhibitors can be broad spectrum. So, uh, so far the signals regarding safety has been reasonable, though there is a black box warning on increased risk of DVTs and um, uh, myocardial infarction. So we have to choose our patients, uh, patients who have a risk factors for uh, cardiac disease and blood clots, they have to avoid. So that's a uh, ma main concern for us. And, um, and it's still being studied in many diseases. Only there are few approved indications. All other diseases, it has been tried uh, empirically, but with a reasonable success in areas like I have used it in uh, skin manifestation of dermatomyositis when none of the um, biologicals work, uh, anti uh, sorry, jack inhibitor tofacitinib work. So, but it is very individual. So, because these diseases are rare, and unlikely that there will be a big randomized trial. So we have to accumulate small case series and uh, gain knowledge over as we use it. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I, I have a question for Dr. Dharmanan. So this patient was initially diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis, but then later the uh, RA factor and anti-CCP antibodies were negative. That was point one. And second, the patient's arthritic I mean, the arthritis manifestations were not as severe as compared to the, uh, you know, the worsening and persistent scleritis that the patient had. Would just like some comments on this point? Yeah, it's a wonderful uh, observation, uh, Doc. And uh, I, I, from the beginning, I was doubting because she was on a full dose steroid. There was no, say, usually the teaching is the scleritis and eye manifestations occur late in the course of rheumatoid arthritis. So we generally see scleritis in patients who already have deforming type of arthritis. So she did not have any uh, clinical arthritis and some of the autoantibodies were positive uh, when she did it in US. When we repeated, they were consistently negative. So we had always a uh, doubt about the diagnosis itself. Are we dealing with an autoimmune disease or are we dealing with predominantly some disease which is causing scleritis and false positive autoantibodies? So that thought process was always on. That's the reason we kept on uh, looking for a cause. We repeated the autoantibody profiles multiple times. And we thought of even um, some of the rarer manifestation of vasculitis. So it's so, um, a good, good point because she was on good dose of steroids. So which could have masked all the uh, symptoms of RA. So we, we can't really comment. When she came to us, she was very toxic with steroids. So entire aim was to control the eye, save the eye and save her from steroids. 
say once somebody starts steroid there should be a exit plan if there is no exit plan we cannot be using more than 30 mg steroid beyond a month that is the the goal of an immunologist or a rheumatologist we don't want anybody to receive more than 30 mg for a month there should be an exit plan whether the eyes are the autoimmunity is better or not we should start reducing the steroid otherwise if not the autoimmune disease steroid will kill them uh, there is a question could there be any pointer towards possible gpa gpa has been thought about and uh, looked for and um, both both by us and uh, doctors in us so they, she didn't have any evidence including autoimmune uh, tests and uh, do we have results of scleral biopsy here uh, padma you are muted there are two yeah. questions related to biopsy Viral biopsy was done. It was negative for microorganisms and it did not reveal any specific autoimmune etiology as well. It was negative. And I'm sure you combined immunomodulators and because that's another question, did you try the combination of two drugs and all? It was tried in the past and it didn't work. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dharmanand, can we use uh, tofacitinib as a primary uh, immunomodulator or it also needs to be added as an ancillary drug? Uh, it, tofacitinib is a, like a powerful drug. We don't want to combine tofacitinib with any other uh, uh, immunomodulator except probably methotrexate. So we would use it along with methotrexate, but not with like drugs like cyclophosphamide, anti-TNF, or uh, azathioprine, et cetera, cyclosporine. Are you worried at all about testicular toxicity? That was a big uh, issue in the United States with one of the JAK inhibitors. Yes, cardiovascular risk is um, real. No, testicular, and sorry, testicular toxicity. Testicular toxicity is not uh, a problem with um, um, uh, with the jack inhibitors, it's more common with cyclophosphamide. Another question, like Padma says, you are giving it in children. So how would you look at the cardiac risk factor for a child? Like you would go in the family history of MI or something, you know, how do you assess that? Because you said you assess the cardiac factor, risk factors. Now, children, this is not a big issue because children are generally um, not a high risk uh, candidates for cardiovascular. So we need to worry about giving it in adults, uh, particularly men uh, and women with diabetes, hypertension, smoking history, obesity, or, or in other words, metabolic syndrome. In, ch in children, that part is a, uh, not a problem. Children, we are always worried about long-term cancer risk. Yeah, long-term, yeah. But no long-term uh, So far, So far, it has been used in children for about 10 years now from the original uh, tofacitinib trial in pediatric rheumatology. So far, the signal has been reasonably comforting. Probably non-melanoma non skin cancer was a little high. Apart from that, there is no increased cancer signal. So they're keeping the fingers crossed at this moment, long term. Uh, there's one more question, Dr. Dharmanan, that do the autoimmune markers fluctuate between being positive and negative with treatment? It can. It can because uh, uh, some of the antibody titers can come down uh, with the uh, high dose steroid, but she had received cyclophosphamide, she had received ataximumab, all can have an effect on autoantibody production. So it can fluctuate. It can, uh, once you are on significant immunosuppression, autoantibodies are a little difficult to interpret. Manisha, time to wind up. Yes, ma'am. So could you please go ahead and uh, give your closing remarks? I think we'll have the last closing remark as a ritual. We have it from all our panelists. So we will start with Lucia. Any last comment or remark for our viewers? No, I think us? wonderful cases. I always learn so much from our colleagues in India. Uh, amazing. Uh, difficult cases and you manage them so well. Thank you for including me. Thank you, Lucia. Marion? Same from my side. Always, I think I learn much more than you learn from me. So thank you for including me and uh, amazing cases, really. Thank you. Lovely having you. And Francesco? 
Yeah, beautiful cases. You always remind me that you have to look for infection and keep looking for infection and keep looking for infections. So amazing. Thank you and great discussion. Thank you very much. And with this, this is the end of our series of institutes presenting their cases. And we look forward to seeing you all in person in Hyderabad, uh, 13, 14. Uh, there is a basic course and the main conference and uh, 14 to 16, sorry, 14 to 16th October, 2022, uh, being organized by LVP. Thank you so much. Take care and lovely. And thank you panelists for being with us on Sunday morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank I you. Like, I would just like to add one more information that we may open this uh, USI conference for our international attendees virtually. So we would soon be sending out the message that how you can register and you would be given a, a, a specific link where you can join the conference uh, sitting back at home. So soon you'll be getting the information regarding that. All those joining us um, in IUSG and USI webinars would receive the information. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.